Hey y'all, this is Brown at IF Brown, and tonight we are going back to 1991 with Marvel Holiday Special number one. So you got this really nice cover by Arthur Adams, aka the great Art Adams. Then you turn it around, and look who is on the run, Santa Claus. So the reason that I initially uh, tracked this book down a while back was because of this guy. Ghost Rider, the Danny Ketch Ghost Rider specifically. And for those of you who uh, check out my reviews on the regular, y'all know I'm on a bit of a Ghost Rider kick at the moment. So um, I was, I, when I was looking up, you know, stories that had him in there, um, this standalone Christmas story oftentimes turned up in, in Ghost Rider, you know, fan communities as, you know, something that was fondly remembered as a, you know, one-off, you know, nicely done one-off Christmas story. And so, I got this uh, book you know, for Ghost Rider, but I ended up staying for the whole show because all the stories in here are very well done and they all managed to convey a message of, you know, hope that comes with, you know, the time of the holidays and Christmas. And one of the things I appreciated about all these stories is that you, you have forced holiday cheer, then you have real holiday cheer. And forced is something like, you know, you're at a retail job and they've got a satellite radio station that plays nothing but Christmas music. That's forced. Whereas this, though, it's more along the lines of, hey, you know, the creative teams for all these stories were, you know, basically trying to speak from the heart and, you know, give a message of hope to humanity. And I really appreciated that. You can tell when, you know, someone's, you know, trying to be real, you know. And so uh, the first story in here is... A Miracle a Few Blocks Down from 32nd Street, starring the X-Men. And so this is a flashback story that takes place in the 70s, which is when the new X-Men were introduced, and, and or they were you know made into a team. You, know, you had uh, Banshee, Storm, uh, Colossus, Nightcrawler, and Wolverine. And also, for bonus points, for this particular story, you have the late, great Dave Cockrum doing the artwork. And Dave Cockrum was the primary artist for these new X-Men, you know, prior to John Byrne taking over the book. And so, you know, it's definitely a nice little, you know, blast of nostalgia because, you know, the writing and the artwork are very much in tone with the stories of the time in which uh, this was uh, set. And also the fact that they got, you know, the original artist, you know, for this team, you know, to come back and do, you know, a Christmas story was a really nice touch. And I mean, just, just look at this, you know, beautiful artwork. And so, uh, but yes, uh, sadly though, Dave Cockrum, uh, he passed away in 2006. And so RIP buddy, you know, you were one of the greats. So this particular story, though, you know, it's, it starts off, you know, of course, around Christmas time. You got the X-Men, um, you know, you know, trying to, you know, you know, put together a Christmas tree, you know, enjoy the Christmas festivities. And some of them are very much, you know, lively and, and, and digging it. And some of the others are kind of like, why are we even bothering with this, you know? But um, so basically, bah humbug, right? But then they get an alert from um, the mutant detecting uh, computer, Cerebro. And so, you know, they go to check it out. And according to Cerebro, it's registering a very powerful mutant, you know, so something that, something or someone that it hasn't picked up in, you know, it has power readings that it hasn't picked up before. And so, you know, the X-Men, you know, usually they, um, fall to say, or they go to, you know, Professor X or Cyclops and uh, Phoenix or Jean Grey, you know, to, you know, figure out what's going on. Um, basically, you know, in, in this case, though, you got uh, Professor X who's on a fishing trip with a friend of his. And then you have uh, Cyclops and Jean who are off doing their own Christmas thing. And so, you know, the X-Men, they're kind of like, hey, why don't we, you know, you know, go out, you know, to the mall where, you know, this signal's coming from and see if we can find the mutant for ourselves, you know, may, and it, hey, it's Christmas, you know, maybe, you know, it's someone who needs help, you know, because the thing is, Cerebro was used to detect mutants, and whenever that happened, the X-Men were sent out, you know, to try and find this mutant and basically offer him or her a place, you know, at uh, Xavier's School for Gifted Youngsters, where they'd be able to, you know, train in their powers and, you know, basically learn to be, you know, members of society, you know, productive members of society and try and live, you know, 
amongst humanity as opposed to apart from it. Or if, say, their powers were too strong and too dangerous for humanity, at the very least, you know, they would be, you know, amongst, you know, fellow mutants to where it's like, hey, you know, we don't judge, you know, and we, and we got, we're people that you're safe with, you know, that kind of thing. But of course, you also had the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, who kind of did a similar thing, except they're kind of at odds with humanity, you know, because unfortunately, humanity as a whole tends to fear what they don't understand. And anytime you got someone with, you know, sudden, with powers suddenly manifesting just out of the blue and sometimes causing destruction, well, you know, humanity is oftentimes um, very retaliatory. And, you know, so it's one of those instances where you can understand why humanity might be, you know, hostile towards mutants, you know, because some of their powers are very destructive. But at the same time, though, you know, you also have the fact that, you know, people like Professor X and the X-Men, you know, they're trying to say, like, hey, it, we, we can work together here. You know, humanity and mutants can, you know, coexist. You know, if we, if mutants, if if we can help mutants learn to control their powers and what have you, whereas the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, they just want to destroy humanity, you know? And so, um, anyway, though, uh, it turns out that um, both teams, uh, both the X-Men and the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants are, you know, converging at the mall, you know, that which is in full holiday decor, you know, for the exact same reason, you know, they both registered that there was a powerful mutant there. And so they run afoul of each other and they, you know, of course a fight breaks out and you have, you know, this group of X-Men and they're going up against, uh, you know, the, um, let's see, the Blob, uh, Unus the Untouchable, Toad, and uh, Mastermind. And so, you know, the, the fight, uh, though, is being observed by someone that we initially thought was just a store Santa Claus, but it turns out, no, this is actually the real Santa Claus, apparently. And so, as he watches the fight, though, you know, he decides it's getting to where it's, you know, too dangerous, you know, for everyone else around, the, around them, like, you know, for civilians and what have you. And so, in this flash of light, the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants are turned into miniature action figures and so Santa in front of the X-Men you know he picks up the action figures and he sort of looks at them and chuckles and says he's gonna have a hard time selling them and they're the X-Men are just looking at him like who are you and so he smiles at them and says Chris Kringle and they're like wait a minute you can't be and and he says I am and, and so um and, and, and they're like, you're the mutant that we, we were trying to find? And he sort of chuckles at that. He doesn't really confirm or deny whether or not he's a mutant. But, you know, he does sort of, you know, you know scoff at the notion that both the X-Men and the Brotherhood, you know, were both trying to, you know, recruit a mutant to their cause or recruit a soldier to their cause, as it were, on Christmas of all days. And so, basically... Um, after having taken care of the Brotherhood, um, he teleports the X-Men outside of the mall and, you know, basically erases their memory, you know, of the last hour, wherein, you know, they had the showdown with the Brotherhood and also had gone to try and find a mutant and ended up meeting Santa Claus. And so, you know, the X-Men, I mean, they found themselves outside the mall with no memory of how they got there. And they're like, well, wait a minute, I could have sworn we were just at the mansion. What's going on here? And then next thing you know, they're hit with snow and it's a gentle snow though. And they're like, well, wait a minute. Now we're okay. I don't know how we got here, but it's like, we, we don't know how we got here, but we're in the middle of a white Christmas. This is beautiful. And then, you know, they see some friendly faces, Cyclops and Jean, who, as I mentioned, were off doing their own, you know, Christmas thing. And so, you know, they, you know, head over to the group and, you know, they all just sort of, you know, end things on, you know, an optimistic note, you know, because it's like the snow just kind of came out of nowhere. And so I kind of like the story. I mean, no, let me phrase it. I did like the story. Um, I like the nostalgic feel of it in the sense that, you know, it looked uh, like something that, you know, came out of an X-Men story from the 70s, you know, mainly because of Dave Cockrum doing the artwork, but also it was written like a story that came from that time period. So it's like, if you look at some of the stories that uh, Chris Claremont and Dave Cockrum worked on together. And then you look at this story, I mean, and you have, uh, 
you know, Scott Lobdell, who was the regular X-Men writer at this point in time, you know, he's the one who did the um, writing for this particular story. But, I mean, it's very much in tone with the tales of back then, you know, so very, you know, positive mileage from the nostalgia factor. And also, though, um, I liked the, you know, lightheartedness, you know, because, I mean, this could have been like a dangerous, you know, battle, you know, what have you, and it was starting to be, but Santa Claus, of all people, stopped it before it could get too much, too out of hand. And so, and I liked how um, the X-Men and the Brotherhood, how they, they were both there for the same thing, but the way they, you know, bumped into each other, literally, was rather amusing, because you had uh, Banshee and uh, Unis the Untouchable, well, bumping into each other by accident and they they both turn around and say oh hey sorry i didn't see you there and then they're like you <laughs> and then next thing you know you know the x-men and the brotherhood are you know, going at it but um so I, so there's little funny bits like that but um but also you know the idea that you know the mutant that they're looking for may well have been the real santa claus um which the story seems to imply i thought that was a nice little touch but i also like the fact that they don't you know, outright confirm or deny whether Santa Claus was in fact a mutant or maybe Cerebro just happened to pick up Santa Claus because he's Santa Claus, you know, so, but Santa Claus being a part of an X-Men story, you know, and the, the time at which this story took place in, it just, you know, it, it kind of flowed well together. And, and so ordinarily, you know, you think Santa Claus in an X-Men story would be ridiculous, but the way they do, did it here was actually nicely done. And, you know, I liked how, you know, Santa Claus was very benevolent and sort of, and had a sense of humor too. Um, but yeah, so that's, that was a good way to start off the, the collection of stories. So the second story is um, A Christmas Coda starring the Fantastic Four. And you have Walter Simonson doing the artwork, and you have uh, Arthur Adams, aka Art Adams, doing. Um, I'm sorry. You have Walter Simonson doing the writing. Now, I said he did the artwork because usually, you know, time was he was an artist. I mean, he's a writer and artist, so I, I think of him as an artist first. So sorry about that. But uh, he did the writing, and Arthur Adams did the artwork. And so these two guys, they work together as the regular creative team of Fantastic Four at this point in time. And amongst other things, they turned out the classic story Monsters Unleashed, which had uh, Ghost Rider, aka Danny Ketch. Um, Grey Hulk, Wolverine, and Spider-Man, you know, temporarily filling in for the real Fantastic Four. And that was an awesome story. So, you know, having recently read and reviewed that one, and then seeing the same, you know, duo, you know, on hand for a one-off Christmas story, I was like, all right, awesome, you know, we're in good hands here. So, um, so the story, you know, kicks off where, um, Franklin Richards, aka the son of Sue Storm and Reed Richards, you know, Visible Woman and Mr. Fantastic, uh, he he and uh, Sue Sue Storm uh, are you know at this outdoor Christmas marketplace you know trying to find some stuff kind of you know at the last minute and um, and Franklin is really wanting to get this you know Christmas ornament that has this you know that has one of his favorite cartoon characters on there and so you know his mom's saying that well remember you you were going to get your father something and. Franklin only has 50 cents on him, and that ornament's 50 cents, but so was, you know, the ornament that he was going to get his dad, you know, but, you know, his mom's, you know, basically kind of takes pity on him, says, hey, you know, if need be, the bank of mom can help, and so, you know, she ends up getting the ornament for Franklin, and, um, and, and he, and he's all, you know, happy about it and everything, and so that way he himself, you know, can get, you know, something for his dad, but, um, Suddenly, though, you know, he hears someone crying, and he's thinking to himself, someone's crying on Christmas? On Christmas Eve? Well, why? What's going on? And so, you know, Franklin being the innocent little kid that he is, I mean, you know, he hears someone in pain, and he wants to help, help them out. And so he follows the sound of the crying, and he ends up in this alley where there's a strange-looking man there, and I mean, it looks like you know something from a long time, someone from like a long time ago. You know, we're talking, you know, old school clothes and what have you. But he's also got locks and chains on him, and he's transparent. And you know, Franklin, he comes up to him, and you know, he's asking, "Hey, what's wrong, Mister? What? what why are you? Why are you sad?" And so the guy looks at him and says, "You can see me." 
And, and so it says, yeah, I mean, you're kind of hard to see, but I can see you though. And he's like, what's going on? Why do you have all these locks and chains on you? And why, why are you crying? And so the man says that in life, you know, he was someone who looked down on his fellow man. Like he refused to, you know, take interest in anyone but himself. And, you know, in, in, in on the occasions that he was in a, a spot where he could have helped someone, he refused to because in his mind, it was all about him, all about, you know, status and you know money and what have you. But unfortunately for him, though, he found in death that, you know, the spirits, you know, that were, I guess, behind the scenes and everything, they didn't look too kindly on that. And so they, you know, forced him to, you know, wear these you know, locks and chains that would keep him in place, you know, uh, you know, to where he would be forced to witness man's inhumanity to man, you know, man's cruelty to their fellow man. And basically a constant reminder that he was a part of that by not you know, being compassionate and trying to help people out when he could have. And so, um, and so he says that, you know, basically, you know, he's less than a shade of a man at this point, or he's less than a shade period, you know, because he's, you know, he, he can feel that he's finally dying, like he, he's vanishing. And, and he, and basically, once he vanishes, then, that'll be the end of it. I mean, he doesn't know what happens after he dies, but he knows that, you know, basically, you know, he can't go on into the afterlife and, you know, where there's, you know, some form of redemption. And, and so, you know, Franklin, I mean, he's just kind of taking all this in stride, but he says, well, wait a minute, if we can get these, you know, locks and chains off of you, I mean, will that help you? And he says, it might, but no key can open these. And so, you know, Franklin says, well, wait a minute, we're, we're, we're in a Christmas marketplace. There's got to be a key around here somewhere. And so he runs off. And at this point, his mom's, you know, frantic looking for him because, you know, he, you know, ran away from her um, when, when he was trying to find the source of the crying. And so she doesn't know where he is and she doesn't know, she, I mean, she's freaking out a mother and she's a mother trying to find her son. In the meantime, though, Franklin, he goes to this market stall where there's this woman who has a key on on top of the table and Franklin's asking her if if she could help him and he's explaining that there's a man in the alley who you know he's uh, he's he might be you know hurt or dying but he's got all these locks and chains on him and he just knows that if he can find a key to get these you know locks and chains open then you know he can help the guy and so the woman you know she you know tells him that you, know, you see this key here, this key can open any lock, but it does not come cheap. It costs everything that you value. And so Franklin, in his, you know, childlike innocence, you know, he's thinking money, right? And so he looks into his, reaches into his pocket and pulls out the 50 cents that he was going to use to, you know, buy his father a Christmas present. And so, you know, he gives it to a woman and she's like, hmm, seems authentic enough. And she allows him to, you know, get the key. But the problem is the key doesn't budge. And he's telling her, it's like, I can't move it. And so, so she says, well, that means you still have something that you value and you're still holding on to it. And something of value doesn't have to be money. And so, you know, Franklin, you know, he, you know, looks, you know, he looks into his coat pocket and he sees the ornament with the cartoon character that his mom bought for him and he's really sad because he doesn't want to give it up he really wanted that and plus you know his mom got it for him but he's like okay and he gives it to her and so she's like thank you and you know he says the key is yours and so the key just falls into his hands and so you know frankly he's like thank you you know and and he's, he's thanking her saying that you know he'll you know, use the key to help the guy. And so, you know, he runs off to the alley. And in the meantime, Sue, you know, she's using her invisibility power to, you know, project a sort of, you know, um, sort of like a hoverboard where she's able to, you know, glide across, glide over the the Christmas crowds to try and find her son. And she sees Franklin running into the, the alley and she sees him talking to someone, but there's no one there. And she sees him like he's trying to, 
you know, open something with a key, except there's nothing in his hands and there's nothing that she can see that he's opening. And so Franklin, you know, he gets to the guy right as he's, you know, vanishing and, and he's like, and the guy's, and the guy's telling him that, you know, it's too late for me, son, but, you know, thank you for trying. And Franklin says, no, no, it's not too late. I, you know, the, the woman, you know, she gave me the key, you know, we, we can save you. And so, and he says, it's Christmas, you know, we, we, you know, magic, this is when magic happens, you know, this is when, you know, good things happen, you know, we're not going to let you die. And so, you know, in, with all the t t t determination that he has, you know, and this is just a little kid, mind you, you know, he uses the key and he opens one of the locks and suddenly all the locks pop open and the chains fall off the man. And the man, he, he's just, you know, stunned, you know, because, I mean, here he was, I mean, thinking that he was just going to vanish into nothingness. But suddenly in this flash of light, you know, both um, Franklin and Sue, they briefly see this man from like a long time ago and looking exactly as he used to back when he was alive. And so, you know, he thanks Franklin, you know, before he disappears. But at the same time, though, you know, Franklin knows that this man has gone on to, you know, a better, a better place now, you know, because he's free of his burden and he was able to help him. And so Sue, you know, she starts, you know, freaking out because on one hand, you know, she's mad that, you know, Franklin, you know, ran away from her. But at the same time, she's like, where, you know, what happened? Who was that? And so Franklin, you know, is trying to explain to her that, you know, the, this was a Christmas he thinks that it was a Christmas spirit, you know, that needed help. And, and thankfully, um, he was able, you know, to find a key that would you know, free him. And so, you know, she takes him home and Franklin, you know, tells the rest of the Fantastic Four what happened. And initially they're thinking, you know, he's just making it all up and it's a good story, but you know, Hey, you're, you got a vivid imagination, but turns out though, that in the spot where the man was, there was a small box and you know franklin says well if i'm if it was all in my imagination then how do you explain this and so reed richards being the scientist he's looking at it, he's like this looks like something from ages ago and and he opened and he's able to get it open and lo and behold you know there's the ornament that um the cartoon ornament that sue had got for franklin and that he had given to the lady and then there's also the 50 cents that um, that he had given to her that he was going to use to buy his dad something. But there's also a coin from the 1800s. And the exact year on there um, it bears a significant, um, bears a certain amount of significance, you know, to the Fantastic Four. Because they're like, that year, wasn't that when he wrote, it couldn't be. And, and so, you know, you kind of get the idea that um, this was this, this coin, it came from the exact same year that Charles Dickens wrote the Chris, A Christmas Carol. And the way that, you know, Franklin described um, the ghost that he met, he may very well have, you know, just, you know, saved uh, the soul of Jacob Marley. And so, you know, you, you know, they're all just kind of like, we don't know what happened, but obviously something of a, you know, wondrous nature has happened. And so, you know, basically they're all just kind of like, okay, Franklin, there's a book we think we should read to you. And so they start to read, you know, a Christmas Carol to him. So this was a nice story. I, one of the things I liked about it was that because the focus was predominantly on Franklin, um, you, you saw things from a child, it's like, from a child from a child's perspective and i liked how you know because you know franklin was raised by a loving family you know he has a benevolent nature and you know basically much like you know other you know kids you know when they're younger i mean when they see or hear that someone's in pain it's like they want to you know go in and try and help that person you know they regardless of whatever the situation is and I know it's like, unfortunately, as we get older, we get to a point where we're kind of cynical about it and we're kind of like, oh, well, you know, that person can tough it out or it's not my problem, you know, that kind of thing. So it was kind of nice to, you know, 
get kind of a you know flashback to a I guess maybe a more innocent time that I think some of us could relate to where when we were kids and you know if someone was in trouble you know then it was just a simple matter to us that hey we needed to help them you know that kind of thing and so the way that Franklin was written I really appreciate how they kind of recaptured that feeling or that that perspective you know <clears throat> excuse me and also uh kind of like uh, the character of Chris Kringle in the X-Men story, there's some ambiguity there as to, you know, what exactly was going on. Like, was this genuinely the ghost of Jacob Marley from A Christmas Carol come to life? Or, you know, was, did, did uh, Charles Dickens, um, you know, write A Christmas Carol to tell, you know, a true life ghost story? And we're just now seeing, you know, the passing of a ghost from that story. And also, um, the woman at the stall, I mean, it's, it may, it's made very clear that she is, uh, you know, a fellow, you know, Christmas spirit. And so, um, and I liked how, you know, she was trying to, you know, teach Franklin about, you know, how something of value doesn't have to, doesn't necessarily mean, you know, money, you know, that kind of thing. And I liked how at the end, you know, because of his selfless nature, you know, I guess, you know, the spirits of Christmas, you know, gave him back, you know, what he gave up in order to help, you know, someone out. And so I liked how you know, there was this, you know, almost, uh, you know, fiction crossing in order to quote unquote reality. But also I liked how, you know, whoever the spirits of Christmas were in the story, it's like they recognized, you know, when someone, you know, does something good and selfless, you know, the, I like how they recognized that. And, and, you know, basically they, they, appreciate that you know someone learned something from them and so it was a, a nice little story and also um while the focus was on franklin i did like how you know sue you know she really came across as you know uh, a mama bear you know because you know it's like i'm sure you know we've all you know whether it be siblings or kids you know we've all you know had that moment where we've lost track of them at, at a store and we're terrified and we're trying to find out where they are and what have you and so when sue's trying to find franklin you know that felt very real i thought and you know and so it's like it's a it's a nice little christmas fantasy story but also i liked how you know sue was depicted as you know a believable you know mother figure you know and so um so yeah that was that was a nice little story um Next up, we have Punisher in Midnight Drear. And so this was written by Stephen Grant with art by Klaus Janssen. And these two guys had worked together on the Punisher series uh, prior to this story. And so it was nice seeing them, you know, kind of come back because they sort of, they did very well with, with the sort of grim and gritty urban environment stories. And this is definitely a grim and gritty urban story. But at the same time, they kind of toned down the darkness, though, because this is a Christmas story. And I appreciated that. Like, I like how it's consistent with, you know, the Punisher's portrayal at this point in time, as well as, like, the visual looks of, you know, the scenery and everything. But also, I liked how, you know, they're like, hey, it's a Christmas story. Let's let's soften things some, you know. Um, so in this story, though, um, Punisher is, you know in disguise as um a, a derelict you know amongst uh, several other homeless people and it's like basically you know they're huddled around a trash can that has fire in it all trying to stay warm and the reason that Fra that frank's there is because um he's heard on the grapevine that there's a meeting a spot nearby that's going to be the the meeting location for you know two uh, groups of criminals and so you know, one of them is like this you know sort of you know, they're members of a Jamaican gang, you know, which, I mean, yeah, they're bad enough. But then on the other hand, though, um, there's a group of people from, you know, a, the legit mob, excuse me. And, you know, basically, you know, Frank's been, you know, trying to get a hold of these guys for some time now. So it's, you know, the mob guys are the bigger fish. But as he's waiting for the two parties to meet, um, you know, he's, you know, listening to what some of, you know, the homeless people around him are saying. And, you know, he especially focuses on this father and daughter, you know, who, you know, unfortunately, I mean, they've found themselves on hard times. And the father, you know, he's breaking down crying because, you know, he can't afford to, you know, get his little girl, you know, just a, a, simp a small little toy, you know, just for Christmas. I mean, 
you know, he just wanted to get her something, but he couldn't even afford that. And so, you know, she's, you know, trying to comfort him saying, it's okay, daddy. You know, I mean, you're, and she's like, don't, don't cry. I mean, you know, they didn't let Jesus, you know, stay at the end either. And so, you know, he's, you could tell that, you know, while Frank's devoting his, you know, observations, you know, to, you know, the spot where, you know, the criminals are about to meet up, you could tell that that kind of gets to him though, you know, because I mean, he had a family and unfortunately they died. And so it's like, you know, he's definitely, you know, listening in on what's, what they're talking about. And so, but then he sees that the two groups of criminals are meeting up. And so um, he takes off, you know, his, the coat that he's using as disguise and he gives it to the father. He says, you know, give it to your kid. You know, it's for her. And so, you know, the guy is first of all like, thank you. But then he sees who gave it to him. He's like, you know, the Punisher, right? And so, you know, Punisher, you know, charges at the guys, at, at the two groups of criminals who immediately both think that, you know, one or the other, you know, set the Punisher on them. And so, you know, they fire on each other. And right before, um, right before they started shooting each other, uh, the group of Jamaicans had, you know, put us their suitcase that they were going to bring to this exchange. They, they had thrown it into the, you know, trunk of the mob guys. And so, um, it turns out that this, you know, suitcase was booby trapped because as, um, the Jamaican guys, you know, retreat after, you know, one of them having been mortally wounded, um, and Frank's pursuing the mob guys, um, like he's able to, you know, uh, catch up to the car, you know, by using some shortcuts. And, but unfortunately though, he's shot uh, in the chest and he's, you know, knocked off the car. And, but thankfully the Cavalier that he's wearing, you know, takes the brunt of it. But the booby trap suitcase though, um, that was in the trunk of the car explodes. And, you know, next thing you know, you know the car ends up, you know, rolling off of the bridge and onto the ground, you know, right in front of, you know, the group of homeless people that Frank was initially huddled amongst. And all this money is, you know, flying out of the trunk. And there's literally like thousands of dollars just flying around. And, and you know, and the homeless people were like, you know, they're just, you know, happy and they're ecstatic because, I mean, there's, there's enough money here for all of them to, you know, make a fresh start. And so, you know, the dad, you know, with the, the with the kid, you know, he's, you know, so thankful and everything. And, and he's like saying how it's a Chris, it's a miracle. It's a real Christmas miracle because, you know, it's Christmas and suddenly everyone, you know, they all have, there's all this money that just kind of came out of nowhere. Um, or, well, I mean, it came from an exploding car, mind you, but you know, you get the gist, but then, you know, he looks up at the bridge and he sees, you know, the Punisher looking down at them. And, and so ordinarily, you know, anytime the Punisher, you know, takes out a criminal and they have a bunch of money on them, he, he takes their money and uses it to finance his war on crime and what have you. But, you know, he's looking down at them and he says to himself that, you know, they could, they deserve the money, you know, way more than me and definitely way more than, you know, these scumbags that are dead now. And so, you know, he's thinking to himself that maybe it's just a holiday cheer, but, you know, they're welcome to it, you know, just, you know, enjoy, you know, this is, you know, basically a Christmas gift, enjoy it. And then he walks off. And this was a very simple story, but sometimes simplicity when it comes to, you know, Punisher stories can be a good thing. And, you know, this was, uh, you know, I like the fact that while the focus was on Punisher going after these criminals, I liked how, you know, you saw that little bit of humanity, you know, that he still had buried within him kind of emerge a bit in a sense that, you know, when he was listening to, you know, the father and daughter, you know, talk to each other, you know, that took him back to his family. And then, of course, at the very end, when, you know, like, after he's, you know, after the, you know, criminals have been eliminated, um, you know, ordinarily, like he would, you know, take all that money for himself, you know, but then it's like, he's like, hey, these people need it more than I do. You know, he's like, it's all yours. And so it's like, you saw, you know, that as much of, you know, a, a ruthless soldier, you know, in a war on crime that Frank was, 
I mean, you saw that at this point in time, he was still human. So, so I really liked that. <coughs> Excuse me. So yeah, I mean, like I said, it was a simple story, but a good one. And, uh, and it just felt kind of relatable in the sense that, you know, homelessness, it's a problem that's, you know, been with us for a long time now. And I mean, you know, for as long as, you know, a lot of us can remember. And so it's still, you know, going on today. And so, you know, stories like this, I just thought, you know, they kind of remind you that, you know, you know, regardless of, you know, your one's economic status, I mean, you know, just because, you know, you're falling on hard times, that doesn't mean, you know, there's no humanity there, like there's a soul there, you know, and so I liked how, you know, a supposedly heartless killing machine like the Punisher, you know, had enough humanity in him to, you know, let the people have, you know, a genuine gift that could help them. So that was a good story. So next up we had, let's see, Thor in Twas a Midnight, a Midwinter's Night. And this story I kind of liked because it, it, it was sort of a, like, what if this was, you know, the basis of all the Santa Claus stories. And so, you know, what you have happening here is um, you have this, um, this, this boat full of um, villagers trying to get their, this food uh, back, you know, to their, to their homeland, to their village, you know, because without the food, you know, the village will, you know, starve. And so, you know, the, the, the women and children at the village, I mean, they're, you know, praying for the safe return of their loved ones and what have you. And in the meantime, though, um, while all this is going on, um, in Asgard, you know, Odin and Thor and others, you know, they see that there's this meteor that's heading towards Earth. And they're able to determine that, you know, this meteor is not naturally, you know, gliding f towards Earth. It's, you know, something is, is guiding it. And so right then and there, uh, this troll sorcerer um, appears in the royal court and, you know, makes and basically says, I'm the one who is sending this, you know, meteor to to Earth. And basically he has enough power to, you know, destroy a good portion of it. And he's saying that unless Odin surrenders um, possession of Asgard to him, then you know, the earth will be destroyed by the meteor and they can't stop it. And so, um, you know, of course, you know, uh, you know, Odin and Thor, they, ref they, they, they hear the troll out and they don't outright refuse him, but at the same time, they don't agree to his demands. And so the troll sorcerer, you know, he's given them a certain amount of time to make their decision. And so, you know, um, Odin is telling Thor after the troll sorcerer has vanished, you know, he's telling Thor that, um, I have a mission for you. And he's telling him that I need you to get, you know, all these um, supplies of food and take them to this village. And Thor's like, wait a minute, you know, you, you, we have a meteor heading towards Earth and you want me to do a, a food run? Really? And, or something along those lines. And Odin's saying, you know, I had, there's a reason for this. And so Thor's like, okay, father, I'll do what you wish. And so, and he's t but he also tells Thor, you know, not to attack the troll sorcerer until a certain point. And so, um, so he goes after the, he engages the troll sorcerer in battle uh, when Th Odin tells him to. And, and this is after he's gotten, you know, the supplies of food. And, you know, and first off, you know, the, the food was brought to the village and he was in and, and it's kind of implied that either he or someone else of Asgard was in disguise, you know, to, you know, deliver the food to the village. And, you know, a couple of people, they see, some, you know, someone in their house, you know, you know, dr you know, dropping off the food and they're like, who is, who is this? You know, do I mean good or ill towards us? But they see that it's food and they're like, you know, th th it's a miracle and everything. But then, but then in the meantime, though, uh, Thor engages the troll uh, sorcerer in battle, and at that point, you know the the sorcerer, you know, basically, you know, says, "You've made all right. You've made your decision. You know, this the earth it will be destroyed by the meteor." And as the meteor gets closer, it comes within range, you know, to where you know Thor was told by Odin to strike at it with Mjolnir, his hammer, and so, you know, he hurls Mjolnir at the meteor, and 
and it's kind of amplified, you know, by, you know, powers, you know, from Asgard. And so it's already a devastating weapon in and of itself, but uh, because of, you know, further enchantments that were gifted to it, you know, for this occasion, the meteor is destroyed. But the destruction, though, um, it, it creates this star in the night sky that's bright enough, you know, for uh, the villagers in the boat to find their way home. And so, you know, they're able to make it home, make it to their village safely with the food, you know, but they find that, you know, everyone else there, you know, already has a, has food. And, but they're saying that, you know, we don't know who it was, but someone came to our homes and gave us, you know, all this food. And so now they have enough, you know, food to, you know, hold them over for Lord knows how long, but they look up though and they see uh, someone, you know, with, uh, it looks like um, rams or reindeer or something uh, towing a sleigh. And, and they see, you know, someone on the sleigh, you know, looking down at them and waving. And, you know, that's kind of how the story ends. And I like this story too. Um, you know, and, and it's like, anytime you throw Santa Claus into a you know, story of the Marvel Universe, you're kind of like, this is going to sound, this is going to be ridiculous, but no, it's kind of like, um, I liked how they didn't actually have Santa Claus per se in this story, but it's like the actions of, you know, Odin and Thor, you know, others in Asgard kind of gave rise to the story of Santa Claus is what the, what the story seems to be implying. And I like that little twist there. And also like the, the nod to, you know, the, birth of Jesus story in the sense of, you know, the wise men following the star, the bright star in the night sky. And in this case, you know, you had, you know, the bright star in the night sky being what guides the villagers, you know, back to their home safely, you know, so that they could, you know, have the food, you know, for their you know, families. And, but in this case, though, the bright star was because of, you know, Thor destroying the meteor with Mjolnir. And so I like the little nod to, you know, Christian, you know, folklore or just, you know, folklore in general. Um, but I mean, the one thing I was kind of confused about though, was, you know, they don't really, I don't, I can't, it was hard to tell if, um, the person on the sleigh, you know, was supposed to be Odin or was supposed to be Santa Claus. I mean, I want to say it was supposed to be Odin, but I wish they could have cleared that up a little bit. But other than that though, I thought it was a nice little story. So next up we have, Ghost, oh, no, 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 uh, Ghost Rat comes later. Um, Captain America in Precious Gifts. And so this story I liked because, um, you know, you have Steve Rogers at this uh, uh, veterans, uh, sent, um, veterans of Foreign Wars uh, building, and basically he's volunteering, you know, to, you know, give out food to the homeless and what have you, because, I mean, or at least to, you know, veterans on hard times, because, I mean, he himself was a World War II vet, you know, and he knows that, you know, a lot of, you know, vets, when they come home, they have a hard time adjusting, or they don't have a place to go, and so he's talking to this woman that, you know, works at the shelter and volunteers there, and, and, as, and he's asking her, you know, so what's, you know, so why are you here? You know, because it's like, you know, you know, as they're, you know, getting to know each other. And she tells him that she had a brother who died uh, in World War II. And all she knows is that, you know, I mean, it was, his mission was classified, but, you know, he died somewhere in Germany. And, you know, and Steve is like, you know, hey, I'm, I'm really sorry for your loss. Uh, what was his name? And so she says his name was James. And so, you know, and he's, and he's asking her, you know, because she, she knows her last name. And he says, so it's James so-and-so. And she's like, no, um, actually, um, it's, it was a different family name. Uh, James Barnes, James Buchanan Barnes. And suddenly Cap's like, it can't be. You know, Bucky had a sister? And he's thinking this to himself, right? And so, and, you know, as, as soon as he's done, you know, volunteering at the, you know, Veterans of Foreign War place, you know, he goes to the Avengers headquarters and uses their computer system, you know, to look up, um, you know, Bucky's history or James James's history. And sure enough, it turns out that he actually did have a sister, but because there was a change in names, you know, 
that's why you know Captain America never heard about it, but also you know Bucky never talked about his sister, and so he takes it upon himself to you know go to this woman's home on Christmas and um, and he you know introduces himself to her and her family, and um, and he lets I liked how he lets the kids uh, play with his shield, um, and he asks if he can talk to the woman in private for a few minutes, and he tells her that um, he was made aware that she had had a brother who had died in, in action in World War II, and he, and he says the, his name, and he says, uh, well, James Buchanan Barnes was in secret Bucky, my sidekick, and unfortunately he did die during the war on a, on a classified mission. And, and she's just, you know, kind of breaks down crying, you know, because and now she at least knows what happened to her brother. And but he's, he's asking her, though, he's like, well, but he never told me he had a sister, though. And, and she explains, though, that um, when both of their parents died, um, she went to go live with her aunt. And, you know, Bucky, you know, or James, you know, he kind of saw that as a betrayal and, you know, you know, sort of cut off all contact with her because of that, because, you know, it's like, you know, he thought that they were going to stick together, but they didn't. And so he just kind of pretended she didn't exist. And that's why he never told, Cap you know, Steve Rogers about her. And so, you know, Cap's like, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry. And, but he gives her a piece of, um, one of Bucky's uniforms that was left over from the war. And he's like, you know, I'm sorry, this is all that, you know, I could find of his, but you know, I hope it means something to you. And she's like, it means everything. Thank you so much. And she actually um, invites him to stay with her family for dinner. And and because, you know, he's like, well, I mean, I don't have any family, you know, to go home to. I mean, yeah, I have friends and what have you, but I want to intrude. And she's like, well, you have a family now. And so I really liked this story. Um, Lynn Kaminsky uh, did the writing, and you know he's almost always been a good writer. Anytime I've come across something, he's he's done. Um, and and you had Ron Lim uh, doing the pencils, and he was uh, the regular artist uh, with Captain America, or one of the regular artists with Captain America at the time. So there's definitely a sense of consistency uh, with you know the story here, and you know say like the books that I mean the the stories that you know were going on Cap's. You know, book at the time, but I just really liked how this was a very humanizing portrayal of not just not just just Captain America, but Steve Rogers the man, and you know you're reminded that yes, I mean he is a super soldier, but at the end of the day, you know he's a human being who you know he's had you know friends who have died in the war, and you know of course you know Bucky was you know his best friend, you know. And so it's like, I liked how they showed that even after all these years, that still haunts him. And so the fact that he he um, learned that Bucky had a sister and how he was able to bring help, how he was able to help bring closure to her, you know, that was a very heartwarming moment. And I liked how, you know, the story ends with, you know, this family sort of unofficially bringing Captain America into their fold, like, you know, adopting him into the family. And, and it was just nice, you know, because it's like, you know, you have two people from that generation. I mean, of course, you know, the woman, she's aged over time, but Captain America, I mean, Steve Rogers still looks like he did when he first got the serum, you know, but at the same time though, it's like they both have that World War II mindset and they both have, you know, memories from that time and they're both able to connect over that and just, you know, I really liked how it was just a nice little standalone story where, you know, Steve Rogers, you know, helps to bring closure to someone and, you know, around Christmas time too. And so, um, and it kind of uh, touched on the fact that, you know, it's, you know, one of the sad realities of, you know, military service is that sometimes, you know, people go on classified missions and they get killed. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, they're, you know, their family members, you know, they're not really told what happened to them. They, all they're told is that they died on a classified mission and what have you. And so, you know, I just, it kind of, I liked how it sort of, you know, brought a little bit of, it shined a little bit of a light on that. Um, there's kind of a reminder that, hey, you know, these people pay a price as in, you know, the people who serve, you know. 
But yeah, this was a really, it was a really nice story. Uh, it was a simple story, but it was a very human one, and I really liked that. So next up, we have Ghost Rider in Ghosts of Christmas Past. And so this was written by Howard Mackey, who was the regular writer for Ghost Rider at this time, and for, for quite some time afterwards. And you have uh, right, you have uh, pencils by uh, John Herbert. And I'm not sure, I mean, I know he's done some other stuff, but off the top of my head, I can't recall exactly what I've seen his stuff in. But, you know, the artwork he did for this story was very well done. And it was it was pretty consistent with the sort of grim and gritty aesthetic that, you know, the Ghost Rider series had at this point in time, you know, under the hands of Javier Saltres and Mark Texaria. And so, um, you know, the, the way this story kicks off is that um, this little kid has been kidnapped from his home by criminals hoping to hold him for ransom, you know, because his parents are very wealthy. And, but in the in the process of, you know, taking the kid away in their car, um, the kid was able to, um, you know, push the door open and, and fall out of the car and run away from them. Uh, but the kicker is, though, this little kid's blind. And so, you know, while he's not afraid of the dark, I mean, he now knows that there are bad men in the dark. And so he's doing his best to try and run away from them, but he can't, of course, he can't see. He doesn't know where he is. And so um, he ends up in the Cypress Hill Cemetery. And, you know, the criminals, you know, they're able to follow his trail. And, you know, the leader, the ringleader of the group is saying, okay, you know, we can't kill the kid because we do that, we get nothing. But you want to rough him up a bit? Have at him. You know, basically because they're pissed off that, you know, a little blind kid got away from him. And then they're going to take his, their anger out on him. And so... You know, the ringleader, he's the one who finds the kid first. And the kid, you know, he's just breaking down crying. And, you know, he's, you know, begging for help. And he actually starts, you know, calling out for Santa to come help him because it's Christmas and it's, you know, snowing and what have you. And so, you know, he's just, you know, the poor kid's just, you know, in terror and he can't see anything. And so the ringleader finds him and actually starts hitting the kid. And that's when a voice says, you know, you will spill no more of this child's blood. And the guy turns around only to be met, met with ghost, uh, met by Ghost Rider. And so Ghost Rider, he uses his chain to, you know, take the guy out rather brutally. And, you know, the kid, I mean, he can't see any of this, but he hears it though. And so he goes up and he's feeling Ghost Rider's boots. And then, you know, he hears the jangling of the chains and he's thinking, bells? And then he looks up at Ghost Rider, sort of like feeling him, and he's like, you're Santa. <laughs> and, so, and so you have this really, it, it, this nice little moment where um, you, you have Ghost Rider looking down at the kid and the kid looking up at him, you know, because, you know, it's like, you know, the kid, See right here, I mean, he's literally thinking that Ghost Rider is Santa Claus. And he doesn't know this is Ghost Rider, but it's like he hears the, the rattling of the chains and he's thinking it's, you know, sleigh bells or something. And he, and he feels, you know, Ghost Rider's boots and he knows that Santa wears boots too. And so um, he's asking Ghost Rider, or he's asking quote unquote Santa, you know, if, you know, he can, you know, help him. And that's when the rest of the criminals um, come up, come up on them, and they, in their ignorance, you know, are are assuming that you know Ghost Rider is just some you know nut job who thinks it's Halloween. But they find out the hard way that no, this is actually a ghostly or demonic you know entity, and he just wipes the floor with these guys, and you know, and he protects the kid and keeps you know and keeps the kid behind him. But, you know, he makes sure that these guys receive a brutal thrashing. And then he subjects them all to the penance stare. And so after that, though, um, you know, the kid's asking, you know, Ghost Rider if he can, or asking, quote, unquote, Santa, if he can take them home, or if he can, if he, if he can take him home, sorry. Uh, and because, I mean, he's really cold and, you know, he's really tired and, you know, he's really scared. And he knows his, his you know, mommy and daddy, you know, they're scared for him, too. And so, you know, Ghost Rider simply says, yes. And so he gently takes the kid. And I like this because, you know, you got spoke, you, he's got these spikes on him, right? 
but he's going out of his way when he's holding the kid to make sure that you know the spikes you know don't touch him and so he you know gets the kid on his bike and he charges off into the night you know riding across all these rooftops and I love how it's talking from the kid's perspective how you know for the rest of his young life you know he would never you know forget you know the time that Santa saved his life and he will and he would always remember the sound of you know the sleigh bells aka ghost riders chains and also the fact that you know all of uh, Santa's reindeer were very hungry because he could hear them roaring or he could hear them rumbling and he, what he was actually hearing was ghost riders motorcycle but in his mind though because he's being saved by Santa Claus you know he's thinking that the rumbling of the motorcycle is you know the stomach rumbling of all these hungry reindeer <laughs> and so um so ghost rider you know gets the kid home you know to the front door of his house and you know the and the kids you know saying thank you santa you know don't forget the milk and cookies we put out for you and and ghost rider just kind of walks off and the door opens up and his mom and dad are there and they're like you know where were you are you okay and because they had gotten a note from the guys who had kidnapped the kid and it was like we were so worried i mean who saved you who brought you back to us and um uh, and the kid's saying santa claus santa saved me he's real and, and so they're like okay who, who saved you who saved you really who saved you and, and there's and he's saying santa santa saved me and so then they look up on their roof, you know, because they hear a rumbling sound and there's a small trail of fire, you know, going across their rooftop and off to, onto another rooftop to the house next door. And they hear the rumbling, you know, going, you know, further and further away. And so they look up at the roof and they look at their kid and they look at each other and they're like, Santa. <laughs> and that's how the story ends. And I really like this story. Um, you know, I'm really, I'm really glad that I, you know, when I first read the story, I was really glad to have finally, you know, had it in hand to, you know, read myself because when I read about it, you know, it just sounded so wholesome, you know, and it's like, and it's something that on paper sounds like it could be a recipe for disaster. You know, a little kid thinks that he's being saved by, he, th a little, a little blind kid thinks that Ghost Rider is Santa Claus. You know, you're thinking, okay, how can they make this into a good story? But they actually do, and you, you you have Howard Mackey, you know, doing a well done story where you see the majority of it, or see the majority of it from the perspective of a blind kid in the sense that we know what's going on, like we see everything that's going on around the blind kid, but from the narr from the standpoint of narration, you know, everything is from the perspective of this blind kid. So as far as you know, the words and everything, you know, and so it's like you really get inside look into you know a scared little kid who's blind but who you know is you know in awe of the fact that quote unquote santa is the one who saved him and that santa is real and i liked how you know ghost rider here his portrayal was kind of consistent with how he was in his own book in a sense that he was kind of seen as something of an urban legend amongst you know criminals and you know common folk alike and you know the fact that you know, the kid ended up in the Cypress Hill Cemetery, Ghost Rider Stomping Grounds. It's kind of like, you know, hey, you know, um, you know, someone, you know, someone needs help. I'm there, you know, that kind of thing. And, and I liked how, you know, Ghost Rider, you know, as fearsome as he was, you know, because make no mistake, when he, you know, gave these criminals a thrashing, I mean, it was kind of toned down, but at the same time, yeah, they got a thrashing. Um, and also, you know, when they got the penance stare, you know, I liked how, you know, you, you get the implication that happened, but you don't see the aftermath, you know, because it's like, you know, he's making a point to make sure that the kids spare from the horror of it all. And, and I liked how, you know, as fearsome as he was, he was trying to go out of his way to make sure that the kid was okay. Like he was trying to make sure that, you know, his spikes weren't going to hurt the kid or, and he was trying to, you know, and he was, you know, trying to, you know, reassure the kid in his own way that he was going to get him home to his family. And so, you know, and also, you know, one thing to note is around this time, you know, you had characters like, say, Dr. Strange and a PTSD ridden Johnny Blaze, you know, convinced that this new Ghost Rider was, you know, a demonic and evil entity. And so while at this point, you know, we didn't know what the origin of Ghost Rider was or this Ghost Rider was, um, and there was definitely a demonic connection 
we get a, a, a reminder that this ghost rider, despite his you know demonic nature, is ultimately a force for good, and we get it in a sense of you know him, you know saving an innocent life, and I really like that, and so um, I'm very glad that I you know not only got to read that story you know that I'd heard about, but I'm also glad that you know I finally got to you know see you know the book that it was in. So this was a nice you know simple you know but very you know well done, you know, standalone Christmas story for Ghost Rider, which is something that I never thought I'd see, you know, a Christmas and Ghost Rider, you know, <laughs> but that was a good one. So next up we have Captain Ultra in It Came and Went on a Midnight Clear. And so Captain Ultra was, um, from what I know about him, I don't know a whole lot, but I, I want to say, um, like he first appeared in Marvel Comics Presents number 50, uh, but he was like a stand-up comedian who um, somehow or another had ended up getting these powers uh, where it's like he had basically, you know, the ability to, you know, go, go hand in hand with, you know, all the other heroes in the Marvel Universe. And uh, so you have a stand-up comedian with superpowers. And so this guy, though... Um, he comes across a rather bizarre scene. Um, you know, all these uh, people are, you know, saying that, you know, their Christmas trees, you know, just got up and left, you know, like broke out of their, the homes they were in and just walked away. And so at first he's like, what is this, a joke? But then it turns out he comes across more and more people who are, you know, crying and, com and you know, complaining about their Christmas trees walking away. And so he's like, okay, something's going on here. And so, you know, he follows the trail uh, and he finds this super villain uh, who's, I think his name was like Plant Man or something. And, you know, this super villain though, um, he's basically trying to make a point though. And he's saying that, you know, um, you know, we, the, we, you know, hum humans in general, they tend to, you know, cut down trees, you know, to a point where, you know, the ozone layer is getting affected. And, you know, the fact that Christmas time, you know, all these Christmas trees keep on getting cut down for a, just a one-time use, you know, it's, and he's, you know, saying that it's a waste and that it needs to stop. And he's trying to, you know, bring awareness, you know, to this, you know, threat to the environment. And so, you know, when Captain Ultra, you know, shows up there and he hears all this, um, initially, you know, everyone's thinking that, you know, Captain Ultra and this plant dude are about to fight each other. But at the but instead though, Captain Ultra is like, you know, you actually have a pretty good point. May I suggest a compromise though? Because look, I mean, you're right. You're absolutely right. I mean, it's stupid, you know, that we cut down these trees, you know, and we only use them one time and then we toss them, you know, but at the same time, Christmas only comes once a year. And some of these people, it's like, this Christmas tree is everything to them. So why don't we, why don't we compromise? Why don't we work together? And so what they end up doing is they end up, um, you know, after Christmas, you know, has come and gone a few days later, you know, they take these trees back and replant them and in, in, in an area where, you know, the ground is fertile. And so, you know, the plant man, you know, he, you know, he's actually thanking Captain Ultra saying, he's like, I was thinking you were going to, you know, punch my lights out, but here you are working with me and, you know, you actually understand what I'm trying to say. And, and at the same time, Captain Ultra's like, yeah, and you understand what I'm saying too, you know? And so, um, and so the plant man's like, oh, hey, by the way, I got a Christmas present for you. And the guy's like, really? And, and he gets this outfit and it's sort of this, you know, um, edgy, you know, dark looking outfit. And so bear in mind, Captain Ultra looks like this. You know, he's a very brightly colored dude. And he's like, uh, really? <laughs> and, and, and so the plant man's like, okay, yeah, you're right. It's not your style. But hey, thought that counts, right? And so the story ends with, you know, Captain Ultra kind of, you know, turning to the reader to say, you know, kind of, you know, you know, add on to the message of the story that, you know, it's like, hey, you know, um, we only have a limited amount of, you know, you know, supplies, you know, for nature, as it were, and, and basically that, you know, instead of, you know, just cutting down a tree and using it once, then tossing it, why don't we, why don't you, why don't we, you know, try replanting them, you know, and so, I mean, this was kind of a, I mean, 
I'm not gonna say it was a great story, but it was a nice little story. And I like the fact that Captain Ultra and the Plant Man actually ended up working together. And if I like the fact that there actually was kind of a valid point to what the story was trying to say about, you know, the environment and everything. And so um, I think some of the jokes kind of fell flat. Um, you know, uh, but maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's because, you know, I, I'm reading this story from the perspective of now, as opposed to say from the nineties, even though I grew up in the nineties, but, um, but at the same time though, I do like, you know, the, the, I, I do appreciate that they were trying to say something, you know, that was from the heart, you know? So last but not least, you have Spider-Man in a Spider-Man Carol. And this is where I honestly think they saved the best for last because here you have, um, you know, Peter Parker, you know, on a uh, photo op assignment where he's uh, going to a children's hospital um, and where his boss, J. Jonah Jameson, is. And basically they're making this big uh, money donation to the hospital. And Peter Parker's you know, assignment is to, you know, take pictures of J. Jonah Jameson, you know, hopnobbing with, you know, the, the kids and the staff and everything. Uh, but then it turns out that the clown that was supposed to, you know, show up to perform at the children's hospital for the kids uh, was a no-show. And so, you know, um, you know, J. Jonah Jameson, he's all like, well, uh, we can, I'll, you know, he starts, you know, giving out newspapers to the kids and he's like, you know, read the bugle. It's good for you. And so the kids were like, really? <laughs> so, and so, um, and so you know, Peter though, uh, he decides, it's like, okay, these kids, you know, are going to get a clown, you know, regardless. And so he changes into Spider-Man and um he knocks outside of one of the windows and the kids are like whoa spider-man and they let him in and and he's and he's you know um joking around with them and that's when you know J. john jameson's all like get out you know because he hates spider-man right and so you know uh, so at first you know you know he's like okay uh, kids i'm sorry but you know they're not gonna let me stay here um I, I gotta go, but, you know, Merry Christmas. But then the kids start insisting on Spider-Man stay, and, you know, and they're trying to tell J. J. John Jameson that, you know, hey, you know, we know that you talk shit about Spider-Man. Okay, they don't actually say you talk shit, but you talk smack about Spider-Man, you know, but here's the thing. He's helped all of us. And so each, and the thing that was cool about this is that each kid uh, is recounting a story that actually happened in some of Spider-Man's own books, you know, wherein he either helped them or some of their family members and save them from super villains and what have you. And each time one of these kids recounts a story to, you know, Jameson, it's like you see him start to, you know, soften a bit, but then he's like, nope, 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 nope. I'm no, no, I have my, I have my standards. You know, Spider-Man cannot be here. And so, um, so basically uh, what ends up happening is that the thing that was kind of, that comes cl the closest from the kids uh, one of the things that comes close to changing J. Jonah Jameson's mind is that one of the kids had a brother who was unfortunately terminally ill with leukemia, but he was a huge fan of Spider-Man. And to a point where, you know, one of the Bugle's own reporters had written a story about him, you know, about, you know, all the stuff that he collects, you know, over, you know, in regards to Spider-Man, like stuff from, you know, battles and what have you, pictures. And so the kids telling about how Spider-Man one night, you know, just came in uh, to, you know, the kid's hospital room and just spent time with him. And, you know, he didn't do it for money or fame or anything like that. He was just, you know, doing something, you know, nice for the kid. But sadly, though, you know, the kid, you know, died, you know, a short while after that. And so that's the moment where, you know, J. John and Jameson, you know, like he's starting to waver and he's saying, well, okay, one good deed doesn't make, you know, a good man, you know, that kind of thing. But, uh, but then, you know, this one of the other kids, you know, says, well, hey, you know, you know, well, guess what, you know, that, you know, you know, guess what, you know, Spider-Man's, you know, also helped you and your son. And, and, and he's, you know, point, this other kid's pointing out how um, Spider-Man had once saved the life of his son, and he'd also saved not only his son at one point, but J Jameson's wife and Jameson himself from the villain, the Scorpion. And so at that point, you know, Jameson's like, he's really reluctant to admit it, but he's like, okay, Spider-Man, you can stay. 
you know, because it's like he realizes he does not want to admit but that Spider-Man has done a lot of good. And even though he has his own reasons for, you know, hating or distrusting Spider-Man, it's like this is straight from the horse's mouth. Like all these little kids have been, you know, affected by Spider-Man. Like he saved their lives and gave them hope. And then you know, when he's confronted with the fact that Spider-Man's helped him out of all people, you know, and he's like, okay, you can stay. But then it turns out that Spider-Man's not in the room at that moment uh, because, you know, he, his spider sense picked up that there were some criminals that were trying to break into the hospital and, and apparently they were trying to get to the safe, but the safe was moved. And so, uh, they break into, um, you know, so, so, uh, and Spider-Man ends up, you know, finding them, and he almost catches them, but then, you know, due to a mishap with a, a water pipe, you know, they're, he's distracted enough to where they're able to, you know, hightail it to the children's room and try and get some, host you know, take them hostage, and so they have the kids at gunpoint, and, you know, Spider-Man's, you know, saying, okay, I'm gone, you know, don't kill them, I'm leaving, and so as he's walking out, you know, one of the kids who's being held hostage you know, actually fights back and, you know, hit and, and hits the guy enough to where there's a distraction and the guy's about to, you know, blow the kid's head off. And that's when Spider-Man is like, uh-uh. And so he gets all in, like all this anger and he just, you know, beats the crap out of these guys. And there's one of them left and he's about to, you know, try and take another kid hostage. But Jameson steps in and smacks the guy's head, you know, with a a vase and knocks him out and you know at that point Spider-Man just kind of looks at Jameson and he just lifts him up and he says you know you know basically you know Jameson's a hero and the kids are all start cheering for Jameson and Spider-Man and Jameson's like put me down <laughs> and so you know then the police come in and at that point Spider-Man's like okay kids now I do have to go but Merry Christmas and you know what have you and so um and so you know the the criminals are apprehended and, and the kids are, you know, asking Jameson, well, are you going to lay off a of Spider-Man now? And so he's all like, okay, all right, all right. At least, and he then he thinks to himself, at least until next year. And that's how that story ends. But I think the re one of the reasons why this was my favorite of the stories in here, or at least one of my favorites, like all the stories in here I think were good. Um, but I think one of the reasons this one stands out is because it really shows you, you know, just how many people, you know, uh, lives that Spider-Man has impacted in a positive way. You know, it's like, I mean, yes, there's tragedy in Spider-Man's life, but he's also done a lot of good. And I think, and I, I liked how they touched on events that happened in his books, you know, through, you know, him saving the lives of, you know, either the kids or family members of the kids and what have you. But I think the, the thing that really got to me though, that actually, I'm not going to say it made me break down and cry or anything like that. But at the same time, I had a moment where I was kind of like, I had to kind of set the book down for a second. Like, Oh man, you know, and cause it was, it was the moment when, uh, they're recounting the story of the terminally ill child who was a fan of Spider-Man and, you know, he went out of his way just to spend time with him and, you know, be his friend and everything. And I remember that story. And I want to say it was called um, The the Boy Who Collected Spider-Man. I could be mistaken about the title, but it's an amazing story. And at first you're thinking, hey, is Spider-Man just being friendly with a fan of his and, and, you know, giving and making a fan's dream come true, you know, spending time with him and, and being his friend and what have you. But it's not until, you know, the end of the story where Spider-Man, you, know, you know, leaves, you know, the, the kid's room and you see him go on to the roof of the building and then he just sort of, you know, you know, like at first he was all, you know, you know, happy and everything, like when he was with the kid. But then when he's on the roof, though, you see him just sort of, you know, break down. And and then, you, you know, as the panels pull back, though, you see that the building that he's at is a home for terminally ill children. And interspersed throughout the story were um, clippings of, you know, a rep from a reporter who was talking about the kid and about, you know, what a big fan of Spider-Man he was. And then at the very end, though, he says, unfortunately, you know, he's terminally ill with leukemia and probably won't ever, 
you know, get to meet his hero. And so you get the idea that it was because of Spider-Man or Peter Parker reading that story, he took it upon himself to spend time with this dying kid. And I remember when I read that story, I just like, I got choked up, I will freely admit. And so I was not expecting a callback to that story uh, from something in here. And so I, <laughs> shit, I'm getting choked up right now just thinking about it, man. But like when it, when when they had that kid's little brother come in and recount the story, I, it just it really took me back, man. And so, uh, and I liked how you know you see that um, these stories are getting through to Jameson. How you know he's trying to keep up a, a gruff exterior and everything, but at the same time, writers who have handled Jameson over the years, some of them handle him in a good way, some of them handle it in others like. The thing is, Jameson's a jerk, okay? There's no getting around that. But you do have those moments where you see either you understand why he's a jerk or you see that there actually is a, a decent person buried underneath there. You just you have to do some digging. And so this was a reminder of that, though, because here you have a guy who, yes, he hates Spider-Man, but he actually does give a damn about, you know, innocent kids. And both he and Spider-Man, I liked how they both agreed that, you know, criminals trying to hurt kids sick kids on christmas is unforgivable and i liked how they actually kind of work together even you know if it was just for a brief moment you know um and even he, and even he had and even he had to sorry about that uh, low power mode i had to hit something here uh but anyway, anyway though even jameson had to you know, acknowledge that Spider-Man had done some good and, amongst other things, had saved his own life at one point. So, you know, all in all, this was just a great collection of stories. And I'm going to go ahead and give a Marvel Holiday Special um, five stars out of five. And so, real quick, though, uh, I'll show you all some of the, you know, pinups that they did. A Fantastic Four pinup. Punisher pinup. Pun sorry, Punisher pinup. Thor pinup. Random snowball fight. But I like how you have all these different Marvel characters there. And you got Thing, Strong Guy, She Hulk. Beast, and of course, Colossus. Captain America and Diamondback. And of course, Spider-Man and Mary Jane. And at the very end here, But yeah, so all in all, this was a really, you know, fun collection of Christmas stories. And, you know, I just, uh, you know, I liked, you know, seeing the different art styles. Um, and it just, and the, and the stories here are really good. I mean, I'm just going to show you real quick. This is from the Fantastic Four story, though. But I like how, you know, they made it look like, you know, this ghost of Jacob Marley actually was a ghost. Like he, how he's actually kind of, you know, fading into the background and you can see through him, you know, little things like that. And then let's see. Oh yeah. Nice shot of Spider-Man there in the final story. Ron Garney did the artwork, by the way. And here's the bit where, you know, the, the story of the terminally ill kids being recounted.
and then it's like you see right here like when it comes to the kids talking like this is probably one of the closest moments that Jameson comes to you know feeling something you know but so yeah uh that was marvel holiday special um i hope y'all enjoyed uh, my you know review and hearing about it uh and you know if, if some of y'all have you know read any of the stories from this uh, collection i mean i'd love to hear your take on them but uh, y'all got any questions comments please drop a line let me know if you like what you see here please feel free to like and subscribe so y'all have a wonderful evening and uh, i know it's summer but merry christmas down the road y'all take care bye